Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory to forever. Our opening procession, our processional hymn is the Troparian uh, to Cyril Methodius on the beige on the beige sheet. Can you all hear? Okay. Please stand. As the equals of the apostles and teachers of the slaves, beg the master of all to confirm us in the faith, and in unity of heart, O Cyril and Methodius, beg him for peace in the world and mercy on our souls. As the equals of the apostles and teachers of the Slavs, beg the master of all to confirm us in the faith, and in unity of heart, O Cyril and Methodius, beg him for peace in the world and mercy on our souls. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and forever. Amen. We honor those priests who gave us the light, who opened the fountain of theology for us by translating the Holy Scriptures. The starting a river from them that still runs today. We glorify you, O Cyril and Methodius, who stand in heaven before the throne of the Lord on high, and to pray so fervently for all of us. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory to forever. How blessed is this gathering in the name of the Lord as we celebrate the Feast of the Ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. I am Father Robert Pipta, and I'm serving as the rector of the Byzantine Catholic Seminary. It is my honor to greet and welcome you on behalf of our board, staff, faculty, and student body. Before we begin, I ask that we silence all modern electronic devices. And now I ask to come forward the Chief Shepherd of our seminary and the Ruthenian Metropolitan Church, His Eminence, the Most Reverend Metropolitan William Skirla, who will offer our invocation. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, O oh, Heavenly King, we ask you to guide the words of, of Archbishop Alexander and to open our minds to the, the wisdom of, of the ancient East. And we ask this in your name. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and ever and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our Byzantine Catholic Seminary family and friends gather this evening for the 18th annual lecture. This lecture series furthers the purpose of the seminary as a theological center and resource for lifelong learning, which embraces Eastern Orthodox sources and patrimony. Our Holy Father, John Paul, Pope of Rome, referred to our patrons, St. Cyril and Methodius, as authentic precursors of ecumenism. 
Fittingly, these lectures provide a platform for scholarly and ecumenical discussion while strengthening unifying spiritual bonds between people of faith. As we endeavor to hand on the tradition of the Christian East, we desire that our graduates enrich the life of the church and engage the world in theological reflection, dialogue, and witness. Looking with hope to the service of the church's future leaders and scholars, our Seminary of St. Cyril and Methodius is pleased to announce the following graduate who tomorrow is to receive his diploma from Metropolitan William. He's journeyed here with his wife. He has seen the birth of his first child while in his two-year program at our seminary, and we're very pleased to have him completing his program with joy. I introduce to you our Master of Arts in Theology graduate, Joshua Van Winkle. Please stand, Joshua. Congratulations. Born in Southern California, this evening speaker received a Bachelor of Arts degree in English from the University of California at Berkeley and a Master of Divinity degree from St. Vladimir's Seminary. He pursued doctoral studies at Oxford University in England under an earlier presenter in this lecture series, Metropolitan Callisto Ware. He spent one year on Mount Athos. After receiving his doctorate, he returned to the United States. He was ordained a priest in 1984 and tonsured to monastic orders in 1986. In May 2012, he was consecrated bishop of the Bulgarian Diocese of the Orthodox Church in America. And in 2016, additionally was named as Bishop of the Diocese of the South. In 2017, he was elevated to the rank of Archbishop. Now that we may glimpse a portrait of Ephrahat of Persia and the place of the presence of God, it is my privilege to ask that you join me in welcoming this year's esteemed lecturer, his eminence, Al Archbishop Alexander Galitsyn, Archbishop of Dallas, the South, and the Bulgarian Diocese. <clears throat> now I've worn this Russian sweat box in order to make proper show, but we'll dispense with it for the talk. I want to point out that, uh, first, that the photograph of me in your program was taken while I was visiting the monastery of my tonsure and where I spent that year that Father Robert just mentioned the monastery of Simonos Petrus and Mount Athos. If any of you saw this, the 60 minutes presentation of Mount Athos a couple of years ago, it was mostly shot at that monastery. Because they tend to be fairly friendly to Westerners, unlike, I'm afraid, some of the brethren. And I think that's especially appropriate, in a way, for today's talk, Athos, as you may know, is the center, not in the sense of uh, Vatican, but nonetheless the real center of the Orthodox Church and the Orthodox, or the Orthodox family of churches. And that because it has, over the millennium of its existence produced holy people in a steady stream who have reinvigorated whole nations with the faith and even in times when their activity was not obvious have provided to the Orthodox faithful often suffering under hostile regimes, 
wars, invasions, and civil wars, the assurance that somewhere, that place, in fact, God is worshipped in earnest, and saints are raised up. And it's been a feature of the Christian tradition from at least the fourth century, I suspect long before, but that's harder to prove. But certainly from the fourth century, it's obvious that the monks, male and or female, have been the great standard of the Christian life and font saints. This was a phenomenon shared east and west, or by east I mean the eastern half of the Roman Empire that spoke Greek, and west the western half that spoke Latin, but it was a feature in common. You might perhaps not know that the life of Saint Benedict, not his rule, they had lots of rules, or monasteries in the Christian East. They didn't particularly need another one. But his life, translated 100 years, 150 years after its composition by Pope St. Gregory the Great, by another Pope, the last Greek Pope, Zacharias, was a bestseller in the Christian East. And to this very day, throughout the Orthodox world, you can find monks named Benedict because that's, it's his life. And in his life, they recognized that type of the monastic saint that was dear to them from their own tradition, that was fundamental to them from their own tradition. Think, for example, Serafim Sarovsky in 19th century Russia, Cosmos of Italia in 18th century Greece, in our own time in Greece, uh, Saints Porphyrios of Athens and Paisios of the Holy Mountain, Cleop of Romanian Moldavia. These are figures who have upheld the faith in their regions because in them was discerned the presence of God and the assurance thereby of the truth of the Christian faith. So with that in mind, I turned to a fourth century figure who no, I doubt any of you has ever heard of. And with good reason. Afrahat, the Persian sage, was, as his sobriquet indicates, a native of the Persian, not Roman Empire, in the first half of the fourth century, he lived, he lived in uh, what's now Iraqi Kurdistan. He didn't speak Greek or Latin. He doesn't ever appear to have read anything by anybody from the Greek or Latin West. At least he's never been caught quoting uh, a church father known to us. He has the scriptures. He has a Persian church that we first discovered through him, although it had clearly been around for some time. It was Aramaic speaking, a variant of Aramaic called Syriac, but still very close to the language the Lord Jesus himself spoke with his disciples in Galilee. And his is the first name and the first set of dates from that Persian church that we have. The dates we know because he supplies them himself, very obligingly. In 343, he wrote 10 treatises called 
that he calls demonstrations or expositions. In 344, he wrote another 12, and in 345, he wrote his 23rd and last. At least the last that we have. And remained after his death unknown, save to the Syriac speaking church, and not particularly prominent there either because he had been eclipsed by his brilliant contemporary Ephraim of Nisibis, whom I'm sure Sebastian Brock talked about to you when he gave a talk here some years ago. And because he was well old-fashioned, sort of passé, He lived, as I know, he wrote, as we noted, in the 340s, but it's not evident that he ever had heard of the Council of Nicaea 20 years earlier. And as I just noted, he doesn't appear to know any, any of the church fathers by name or by writing. And in return, he himself is ignored by the entire Christian world outside of that Syriac-speaking milieu with the ex one noble exception of the Armenians who troubled to translate him sometime, I think, in the 8th or 9th century. And then finally, uh, a Jesuit scholar at the turn of the 20th century renders his demonstrations into Latin and immediately generates a minor scholarly industry. The industry is based on the fact that although he doesn't, as I know, as noted twice now, he doesn't appear to have any contact whatever with the church in the Roman Empire. He knows about it, but not much more than the fact that it's there. <coughs> and you might recall that in those decades, early in the fourth century, the monastic movement is exploding in Egypt and spreading from Egypt throughout the Roman world. Well, Afrahat draws through scholars' interest because he has his own native kind of monasticism, totally uninfluenced by the Egyptian brand, apparently quite a bit older, because although it's the first thing, the first time we hear of it, it's already been there long enough to have gone bad in places, uh, and in ways that Afrahat feels obliged to address in his demonstrations. In his community, the ascetics are referred to as single ones. And I'll, well, I'll break a rule that I usually make, which is not to introduce foreign words uh, into lectures or especially sermons, um, but I'll break that rule today. He refers to his ascetics as ichidae, it's, um, the Syriac word is derived from the root for the, for the word one. So singles or singled. And its obvious first meaning is celibates, people not married. But secondly, the word ihidaya also translates in the Gospel of John, chapter one, Verse 14, I think it is. The Greek word monogenis, only begotten, the only begotten of the Father. In Syriac, that's the ichidaya of the Father, the only one of the Father, the single one. So the ascetic is also in imitation of the Ichidaya, who is Christ. Thirdly, these ascetics are bound together in a covenant. The Syriac word is keyama, and they are referred to collectively as, if they're male, the bnei keyama the sons of the covenant, or a female, the Bat Kayama, 
the daughters of the covenant. And the covenant was something apparently done in church. Here again, there's a difference from the Egyptian model that begins with Antony and Pacomius and Macarius of Sciti. Because the profession of singularity is made before the bishop and in the liturgy of the local city or village church. And they appear to have had their own special place in the church. They lived in the towns, not off in the country like St. Antony or St. Pacomius or St. Macarius. And they lived together probably in, as singles or in twos or threes and simply went to the local church for services. Now his 23 demonstrations are with one exception addressed to this body of people. The one exception is uh, demonstration 14 which is a kind of Catholic epistle addressed to the Persian church as a whole which Afrahat takes ferociously to task for assorted sins. So half the very long uh, demonstration is devoted to the wickednesses of the Persian Christians and their bishops and clergy, especially the bishop, the bishop of the capital, Seleucius Stesiphon, who was taking on imperial prerogatives that Afrahat thoroughly disproved of. And the second half, with the uh, virtues which are to be juxtaposed to the sins enumerated in the first. However, in the middle, there's a break. He kind of, after this catalog of woes, he kind of takes a breath and says, now let's talk about God. He talks about the omnipotence, the infinity of God, the unknowability of God, the immensity of God, moves from there to the love of God, and in particular, to the love of God as evidenced in the coming of the Lord Jesus. Azartra Butak, he has said, he says, you have made your greatness small in the Incarnation. The background to his thinking there is undoubtedly the kenosis of Philippians 2, who emptied himself and took the form of a servant. You have made your greatness small, small enough even for us to enter by our mouths, by the gates of our bodies to dwell in us and walk in us. Okay, and it's in that context of this break, this interruption of, of kind of Jeremiah, that he takes a further time out to sketch the outlines of the Christian holy man. And that's the long passage that I will read in just a moment and then talk about. But I want to preface that a little bit with how I got interested, an autobiographical note, if you will, how I got interested in this guy and why he's important even though nobody had ever heard of him outside of the Armenians and other Syriac speakers until the 20th century. Why is it significant? And here, if I may address myself to the seminarians present, you have doubtless been taught, I trust you have, in your classes, that the fundamental soteriology, notion of salvation in the Christian East is 
summed up with the funny sounding word deification. Yes? And it is a funny sounding word, especially to English speaking ears. It sounds like something, in fact, very wrong. Or at the least, impossible. And this has been noticed in the scholarship. I don't know how much, I doubt that the stuff you were asked to read, at least I hope not, um, took a very critical attitude toward this, but certainly if you read the older literature of uh, German, especially German, um, any, any good speaking scholars, deification is a word which is, makes them very uncomfortable and in fact often outright hostile. For example, the great Protestant uh, historian of dogma, Adolf von Harnack, who, by the way, can still be read with profit, because although you might not like his overall scheme, he read everything. And his footnotes can still be cons consulted with profit. But for Harnack, this was the ultimate betrayal of the Christian gospel, which was the brotherhood of man and the fatherhood of God. It was pure Greekifying. It was Plato pulled in underneath the guise of the law, the prophets, and the gospels. After all, Plato in the Thetis does talk about becoming like God for the philosopher. So this is clearly a Platonist. And the first time I think the word appears, it's in Christian Alexandria in the early third century and coming, I think, was it Clement? Right. It's got a Clement expert over here. Um, and one thing clear about Clement of Alexandria and his great successor, Origen, was that they just loved the philosophers. Clement quite openly, Origen not quite so openly, but just as obviously, well, given that genesis, if you will, clearly this doctrine was a pure importation of Hellenistic philosophy into the Semitic roots, the biblical roots, of the Christian faith. Well, that's where Afrahat comes in, but again, we need a little bit more preface. Maybe you, going to seminary, noticed, I did, that while we've got this huge body of scripture, well, it's that thick, but you might note that only that big a part is about Jesus. The Bible, right? Then there's this huge part, which isn't. You know, it starts with uh, in the beginning and that you know, has all those really dull laws. And then those terrible histories with wicked kings, very few good ones. The prophets, the Psalms, all those proverbs and proverbs, pages and pages and pages of proverbs. Well, what's all that got to do, first of all, with Jesus, and let alone with deification? In fact, how does it fit in at all? I mean, those of us who grew up in the liturgy of Byzantium uh, will recall that on the great feasts like tonight, at the Vespers, we will read three passages from the Old Testament. And on the other great feasts, on maybe on Holy Saturday, we'll read a whole slew of them. And quite a bit of it during Lent. But the rest of the year doesn't appear in church, does it, except for the Psalter.
Well, in fact, it has quite a bit to do with it. Well, that will take me down a path that will lead to another lecture, so I won't quite go down all the way. But I will point to a couple of things. First of all, something that we all recite every liturgy, the creed. We say the Lord Jesus rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. Uh, have you ever wondered what scripture talks about the third day? Now there's Jonah, and that's fair. I don't think it's the one though. And again, the liturgical tradition offers a suggestion. Not a suggestion, I think, a fact. On Holy Thursday morning, we celebrate the, you know, uh, the liturgy which marks the Last Supper. The institution, as our Western brethren like to say, of the Eucharist. And the first reading from the Old Testament for that particular Vesperal liturgy is Exodus 19. Exodus 19 is the great theophany, or the beginning of the great theophany, which actually lasts more or less through the whole book. Um, the great theophany of God, the great manifestation of God on Mount Sinai. And Moses is told by God, tell them to prepare themselves. Clean up. No sex. Get it, to, get it, to get ready for the offering. And on the third day, I shall appear on the mountain. I suggest that's the third day in the creed. Now I just used a word, theophany, as Father Bogdan there uh, knows very well. That's a very important word for me and for the tradition. For Afrahat and for the faithful down the generations. For our liturgical tradition. Theophany. There are several. That's manifestation or appearance of God. And there are several in the Old Testament. The great one, of course, is Sinai. But there's also God appearing to Isaiah in Isaiah 6, from which we take the Trisagion of the Divine Liturgy, the Sanctus, Sanctus, Sanctus. The Kedusha, as the Hebrews say. Or the Syrians. There's Ezekiel 1 and the manifestation of God on the chariot throne, an appearance like a man. And connected with this theophanic tradition, there is a word, and one particular word, glory which appears throughout Exodus, often in the Psalms, in a number of the prophets, and has the weight of a kind of technical term. It means God visible. The glory of God appears above the mountain. The glory of God takes up residence in the tabernacle at the end of the book of Exodus. The glory of God is prom the vision of the glory of God is promised to all flesh in the beginning of second Isaiah. And in the early second century, Justin Martyr makes explicit that this glory refers to the second person of the Trinity. One more element from Old Testament, actually from, again, from the book of Exodus, and that is Moses going up at the end of the book 
This is after the episode of the golden calf, when, as you recall, God is kind of ticked off. Says Moses, I've had it with this bunch. They're out. Let's you and me, we'll go have, we'll go, we'll go make another people. Okay? Moses said, no, 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 you can't, you can't do that. No, no. Um, and gets him to back off like Abraham tries with uh, Sodom uh, in Genesis. But Moses succeeds, whereas Abraham didn't. Um, so God says, I like you. What can I do for you? I'm paraphrasing. Um, and Moses says, show me your glory. This is Exodus 33, which incidentally is read on two occasions in the church year on the E on at Friday of Holy Week for the Vespers and at the Vespers of the Transfiguration in August. Clearly the glory of God is visible. Our Lord both were transformed on the mountain of Tabor and naked and bleeding and dead on the cross. <coughs> anyway, Moses says, show me your glory. And God says, Boom. listen, if you look at my face, you'll burn up. Uh, so I'll tell you what, I will put you in this cleft of the rock and I'll put my hand over it. And I'll make my glory pass by and you'll see my back. You'll see my back. And even that, the last point, even that is enough for Moses himself to be transformed so that he comes down from the mountain with a face so bright with light that it terrifies the Israelites and he has to wear a bag over his head um, to keep them from freaking out. <clears throat> now, incidentally, uh, St. Paul makes cons important use of this episode in 2 Corinthians 3 where he says, yeah, Moses had that. Yeah, he was bright, but it faded. You Christians, you, you've got something better. You, in fact, are being transfigured daily. And the light of the face of Christ appears within, within your hearts. So I think we're touching, we're beginning to touch, are we not, on the notion of deification. But now let's turn to Afrahat. This figure, unknown, as I said, outside of his native milieu, and totally unversed in the vocabulary of the Greek Christian tradition. He was an Aramaic speaker, and his theological diction is much more akin to the rabbis of the neighboring schools in Mesopotamia with whom he quarreled, at least via intermediaries, than it is to the language, say, of a, even of, of, an, of, an, of, a, of, a, of an Irenaeus, let alone an Origen or Clement. Well, I want to Having said that, then, by way of preface, let me read you his portrait of the Christian sage. This occurs in Demonstration 14, columns 660 through 665. And it begins with an uh, a quotation from the book of Job, chapter 28. Who has perceived the place of knowledge? Who has attained to the roots of wisdom? And who has discerned the place of understanding? Now, if you recall your Job, the answer to those questions is nobody, or only one. 
only God. We can't know these things. Wisdom is hidden from all living things and from every fleshly thought, nor can the stupid purchaser with gold. Her treasure, however, is open and permitted to those who seek her out. Her light is greater than the sun, her radiance more calmly and beautiful than the moon. The innermost chambers of the intellect may touch her, and the spiritual senses may attain to her, and fullness of mind may possess her. Whoever has opened the door of his heart finds her, and whoever unfolds the wings of his intellect possesses her. She dwells in the man who is diligent and is implanted in the heart of the sage. Her sinews are firmly established in her sources, and in her the sage possesses a hidden treasure. His thought flies to all the heights and his pondering descends to the depths. She inscribes wondrous things within his heart and the eyes of his perceptions take in the bounds of the seas. All things created are enclosed within his thought and his inclination thus to receive becomes yet more vast. He becomes the great temple of his creator. Indeed, the King of Heaven enters and dwells in him and lifts his intellect up to the heights. The King causes his thought to fly to the King's holy house and makes manifest the treasure of everything within it. The sage's mind is absorbed in visions and his heart is wrapped in its perceptions. A thing he never knew is shown him. He gazes on that place and contemplates it. And his mind is stupefied by everything that it sees. All the watchers hastening to his ministry, the seraphim chanting the thrice holy to his glory, flying swiftly with their wings and their vestments white and shining, hiding their faces from his radiance, their course is swifter than the sun. I'll pause for a moment there. I want to un unpack that last set of sentences. Or the last sentence, actually. The watchers, the irin, that's the word that we find as early as the uh, first book of Enoch, referring to the angels. Kind of the angel, the angel, the angelic deacons, if you will. The seraphim of the priests. The watchers hastening to his ministry. The seraphim chanting the thrice holy to his glory. Hiding their faces from his radiance. The question is, who's the his? And our first thought, obviously, well, it's God, right? The sage is elevated to see the heavenly throne and the heavenly liturgy, the divine glory. And by the way, the, uh, the assumption of uh, heaven as a liturgy is not something uniquely Christian. It goes back again to that Old Testament that we can't seem to find the relevance for. Um, but that will again take me down a different, I won't go there. Man, there's only so much time. But, so his ministry, his glory, his radiance, who is the his? Well, the grammar of Syriac, like Hebrew, they have little suffixes they tack onto words, indicating, um, you know, uh, second, first, second, third person, singular, plural, masculine, feminine. Well, the nearest antecedent, masculine singular antecedent to the his is the sage. Oh, the angels hastening, the watchers hastening to the sage's ministry? Chanting the thrice holy to the sage? 
and veiling the angels, the seraphim yet, veiling their faces from the sages' glory? This is, without a doubt in my estimation, the most, the boldest statement of deification in Christian, in Christian literature of the first centuries. From someone who didn't know the word deification. But he knows the fact. And you ask, what is this from? Well, now it's clearly not Greek. I mean, this kind of language isn't Greek. Not, the philo not Plato, anyway, or the philosophers. Where is it from? Well, the answer is, works on several levels. First level, simple. Think the opening of the Bible. Think Genesis 1.26. We shall make him in our image and likeness. In the image and likeness he created them. Okay, so it has to do with the image. But the second level, who's the image? You might recall if, you, if you've done, if you, I don't know who taught your Bible, but you know there's some differences between the Greek and the Hebrew in the Old Testament. There's a kind of important difference in this one verse, or at least a modification in the, Hebrew, in the Greek. The Hebrew is a simple in, well, maybe not so simple. Um, it might even be instrumental. But in the image. But Salem. The, he, the Greek has according to the image. Kata. According to the image. We shall make it. our image and likeness. We shall make it. Well, the according to suggests a third party, yes? There's the speaker, God. There's the human about to be created. And there's the image of God according to which the human is created. I had a wonderful time doing this with my 18-year-olds at Marquette. It's the one reason I like teaching Introduction to God. Um, got to do all this Bible stuff. So I'd make them turn then to Colossians, where St. Paul opens as a chapter 2 book, by calling Christ the icon. He is the image. Probably the same notion is in the idea of the Logos, or a related notion. Not the same, but related. The, the mediator, yes? So secondly, it is Christ who is image and glory, as we saw earlier, as we noted earlier. And as it works out, I think, in Afrahat, although the Christological resonance isn't so clear, in what I just read you, indeed, he's talking about the indwelling Christ. But let me finish the passage. There, in that place that he sees, where the angels are ministering to him and the seraphim veiling their faces from his radiance, that there is the throne of the kingdom established. There the judge makes ready the place of judgment. There the chairs of the righteous are set in order for them to judge the wicked on the day of judgment. And when the sage, the sage has seen in his mind the place of many treasures, his thought is elevated and his heart conceives and engenders every good thing. 
and now he meditates on everything that before he had sought. Thus, while his form and appearance are earthly, his intellect is at once above and below, his thoughts swifter than the sun's course, its rays quicker than the wind, swift as wings in every direction. Though his appearance is small and humble, he is yet infused and filled with a mighty treasure. The darkness at night is made light for him, and he sends his intellect out on every side. He has seen what his ears have not heard, and has perceived what his eyes have not seen. His reflection traverses the seas, and he thinks nothing of their mighty billows. Without ship or sailor is his intellect, and great and good is the wealth of his trade. When he gives from what is his, he's no whit the less, and the poor are made wealthy from his treasure. There is no limit to his mind, which is gathered up and lodged in his inner being. And that inner being is the place where the king dwells and is ministered to. And who could calculate its treasures? Many are its affairs and its expenses, as with a king for whom nothing lacks. So, in the second part just read, the sage isn't merely recipient, he's also giver. He makes the poor wealthy from his treasure and is no whit the less. In fact, he is a place of infinite resource. No limit, says Aprana. Infinite resource. Now he repeats that imagery in one of the more remarkable passages, or at least, well, in a set of remarkable passages, of which I've just read the most remarkable. But at the end of Demonstration 10, he also provides us with something which is almost unique in Christian literature. The only other example is Simeon the Theologian. At the turn of the uh, second millennium, Constantinople. 700 years later and in a totally different milieu. At the end of Demonstration 10, a demonstration, yeah, demonstration 10, Afrahad speaks of his own experience. The master of the, how of the, the master of the house brought me to the treasure house of the king and showed me there its many good things, and when I saw them, my understanding was wrapped by the great treasure. And when I gazed on it, it dazzled my eye and took my thoughts captive and bewildered them with many colors. Whoever takes from it becomes wealthy and makes others rich. Everything he had sought before has opened up and permitted him. And when people take much away from it, he is no wit, it is no wit the less. He spends the next two columns elaborating on the inexhaustibility of this treasury of heaven that he's been shown. And he concludes finally by identifying both the steward and the treasure. It's true. The treasure is, does not lack since it is the wisdom of God. And the steward is our Lord Jesus Christ, as he testified when he said, everything has been given me by my Father. Indeed, he who is, who is the steward is also the wisdom itself. As the apostle said, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. This is the wisdom which is distributed among many, yet is no whit the less as I demonstrated to you above, and from the spirit of Christ the prophets received. Yet Christ was made no whit the less. So all is Christ. To shorten a 40-page single-space article, um, <laughs> those, whom, uh, those whom that one rather, whom the seraphim veil their faces before and to and sing the thrice holy before and whom the watchers hasten to serve that is Christ in the sage 
But the sage in turn is thus Christophany. The appearance and presence of Christ and theophany. Now, a half a generation after, uh, no, a generation after Offerhat wrote this, although totally unrelated, Athanasius of Alexandria publishes his life of Antony, what our friend Har von Harnack referred to as the most stupefying book in European history. <coughs> he didn't like it. Um, but whose influence can certainly not be underestimated, and which is devoted with a few uh, touches uh, of Athanasius himself, who's using St. Athanasius, St. Antony, in part as a kind of theological advert for uh, St. Athanasius' position on the homoousion, on the consubstantial. Uh, is a portrait of the, of the monastic saint. And the portion of it that I should like to underline for this particular purpose in comparison with Afrahat, or rather in parallel with Afrahat, is when Antony comes out of his self-imposed uh, prison. He's gone off, you know, if you remember the story, he starts out by the village, and that's not far enough out, so he goes to a tomb in the cliffs above the Nile, and that's not far enough. So then he goes way out into the deep desert to an abandoned fort and locks himself up, and nobody sees him for 20 years. And finally the neighbors, well, the friends, whoever, the villagers that he comes from, what happened to Antony? Is he still alive? So they go out and they knock down the door of the fort. And Antony comes out, says, says Athanasius, wholly natural. The Greek phrase is actually a bit more redolent. He says, wholly in that which is according to nature which doesn't sound good if you're an Augustinian, because um, nature's fallen, right? it's corrupt. But in Athanasius' phrasing, it means essentially Antony comes out of there like Adam before the fall. He's wholly balanced. Not too fat, not too thin, not depressed at seeing all these people, not giddy with seeing all these people and immediately does miracles. And the people are amazed. And the Archbishop is using language which deliberately, rather clearly, deliberately echoes the Gospels and the wonder of people before the signs that Jesus does in his healings. And finally, Athanasius says, he comes forth from his desert refuge as, a whole, as one wholly initiated. Memistogogumenus. Wholly mystagogized. Wholly initiate into the mystery of Christ. comes in short I put it a little radically but I think truly he becomes in short the visibility of Christ and that I suggest is what our holy man is for Afrahat as well as for Athanasius a whole empire away a in a completely different culture with a completely different language and no communication between the two. This is a common element in their common understanding of the Christian tradition, not one that they held consciously in common so they didn't know each other, but it's foundational for both of them. 
so foundational. That's why he fights Arius. Does that make sense? Because Arius means a cut off from the communion with God, but Christ is an enabled. Now, given then that these two are not influencing each other, not communicating with each other, we ask again, we ask yet again, where is this from? And my answer in that 40-page single-space thing that I'm going to do, you know, that will be here till midnight and past. Uh, we have to triangulate, yes? And the common source is not the, uh, the wonderful Christian Platonists of Alexandria, Illumining will they be? It's certainly the New Testament and St. Paul, whom I've cited at least uh, a couple of times. But it's rooted in the, rev the single revelation to Israel. Adam braided in Moses coming down the mountain with a shining face. In the high priest, in the book of Jesus, son of Sirach coming out in chapter 50 of that book on Yom Kippur to pronounce the divine name the one and only time that it was ever pronounced in Israel the one once a year and where the high priest appears in one scholar's reading with whom I sympathize a great deal as theophany, liturgical theophany if you will yes God visible in the person and vesture of the high priest. Well, that's a Christian bishop, an Orthodox Catholic bishop in the celebration of the Eucharist, yes. You take up your throne at the high place, your eminence. You are picturing God on the throne surrounded by his, the angels of the face, the presbyter. And before the altar as the great high priest, the one great high priest. But so with the Christian. And this is one of the, again, one of the, not in Afrahat, that's uh, so later. But um, in the Syriac writers, Syriac ascetics, about a generation or two later, we begin to get <coughs> literature which is fundamental to someone like Dionysius Arabagidis or Maximus Confessor down the line, the connection of the liturgy to the inner transformation and its necessity for the inner transformation. But that again will take us down a different path. What I want to underline here with Afrahat and his importance is that he underlines for us the significance of our patrimony as Christians from Israel. The revelation made once and for all, for it is really one revelation from Abraham to our Lord. Seamless and unbroken. And its message. Well, as Afrahat sums up along, almost exactly along the lines of Irenaeus, and I'll quote Irenaeus, God became like us, that he might make he, us like him, and sharers of him. And that is the patrimony, my dear seminarians, that you should be taking to your faithful. That is the serious, undying, living tradition. That we are called and there have been in every generation exemplars as his holy man. We are called to be for a perishing world the visibility of Christ God to whom be glory with the Father and Spirit. As a rector, your eminence, I'm 
grateful that you can so clearly and profoundly charge our seminarians with what is needed for their ministry, but what is needed for their salvation. And for all of us, may we, hearing these words, indeed become the appearance and presence of the holy natural. Thank you for this talk. We also must express our gratitude to Father Andrew Deskovich and the staff of the Cathedral of St. John the Baptist for hosting this lecture. I'd also like to thank our seminary's graduation and lecture committee for their many efforts in making this event run smoothly. We will now have some time for questions and answers. Please note the microphone here. And when you um, have a question for His Eminence, please do approach the microphone and uh, state your question so that it can be recorded and the answer will then be better understood. After some time for questions and answers, we'll have a concluding hymn and then a reception at which we encourage you to enjoy the light refreshments. And also, after the lecture and the question and answer period, take a moment to consider the offerings of the Byzantine Seminary Press that are behind us here in the hall. So please, if you have um, a question for His Eminence, please do approach the microphone now, and I will ask Archbishop to return to the podium. What Bible do you think that he was reading from? Uh, do you think he was reading from the Septuagint or more likely the uh, Syriac Peshitta? He was reading, they have of course their own translation. Uh, it's called the Peshitta. And the Peshitta uh, Old Testament is a kind of combination of things. It's not all from the Septuagint by any means. Some of it I gather, I'm not an expert here, some of it, I gather, is directly from the Hebrew. And then there are books which are from neither the Hebrew directly nor the, nor the Septuagint, uh, like the books of Chronicles, which are the Targums. Uh, the, targums were, uh, which are, uh, the Targums were a kind of paraphrased Bible read aloud in the synagogues after the reading of the Hebrew, because of course the Jewish population of the region was no longer Hebrew speaking. This was a dead language. So it had to be rendered into something they could understand. And the renderings were usually embroidered with, if you will, theological commentary or whatnot. And chronicles are uh, examples of Targumim that are part of the Peshitta. Okay, a follow-up question mm -hmm. would be, um, when he was thinking about Genesis, then uh, if he's thinking about the, the Peshitta, it would be Bezelin, right? Instead of thinking about Meta from the Septuagint. Kata, Bezalem, yes, yes. It would be with a but, not with a Kata. Um, so but, but, I said, I also said, there's a little bit of ambiguity in the Hebrew too. Because the ba of Betzalem, the ba can have, can have an instrumental sense, not merely a locative one. Um, and there appears to have been a current of reading of that in the image, which equated the Betzalem of Genesis 126 with the Bahokma in wisdom of Psalm 104 that we read at Vesper. You have made all things in wisdom, with wisdom, by means of wisdom. Okay, fine, thank you. All right, so by means of the image, you get the same, you get something similar to 
what you've got. I would just say that that's not the normal way to translate the Hebrew, so that was why I was curious. No, it's not normal. No, no. And it's not, it's, yeah. if you were to see the way that the thought is used in Hebrew, it's seldom used that way. But seldom, yes. true. true. But this is a line of uh, a line of interpretation that's running about the time of Christ, okay. I think. Right. Not the only one, you know, not the obvious one, but it's there. Origen uh, quotes his Hebrew teacher uh, a wonderful line, a wonderful saying that he that Origen approves of mightily. He says, "My Hebrew teacher told me." All of Scripture, every verse of Scripture is like a locked door. And at the foot of every locked door, there is a key. But the key at the foot of any particular door does not fit that lock. <laughs> Meaning you have to have all the keys and know all the doors in order to make it work. Yes? The ancient, you know, biblical literalism that we face in our Protestant brethren as a creationist and all that kind of stuff. That's recent. Mostly, that's a post-enlightenment phenomenon. The ancient world on the whole does not read scripture in that kind of linear engineer's way. I always think, what is the engineer's approach to scripture? Yes, it's a blueprint. Sorry, your, your turn. So there's, there's um, um, an interesting passage in uh, Demonstration 6, 14, um, and I, I can't quite make sense of it. Uh -huh. I'm not sure if he's talking about a, a kind of trichotomous perspective in anthropology or if he's talking about eschatology. There's, there's also a passage where I, I can't figure out who the he is that we're referring to. Um, so this is when, when a man dies who just has the animal spirit, the animal spirit's buried with him, but then the resurrected man receives the spirit Right, and then he goes on to say, um, the Holy Spirit that was kept in purity. I don't know who's keeping it, uh, or if it's the, the spirit. The person who's been keeping it in purity. The, so, so the person who's keeping it in purity, it says receives, the, the spirit that was kept in purity receives great power from its nature and comes before Christ and stands at the door of the tombs. Right, so I, I don't know, this sounds, so he says he receives the Holy Spirit that was kept in purity. Is this Holy Spirit referring to the Holy Spirit, or is it referring to... I think so. Bogdan, what do you think? <laughs> it's very ambiguous, that's the reality. I don't think that we can exactly figure out, because one of the things that he doesn't have is clarity on some of these issues. It's not the only one, it's not very clear. On this particular issue, which spirit is he also doesn't distinguish in a way that's fully satisfying between the Spirit of Christ and the Holy Spirit. That's also that. So I don't think that I can actually give that. Remember, he is pre-Nicene. This is, although he's writing in the 340s, he really belongs, if you were to compare him with other people, he belongs with the third century. So far as you know, he, Greek Christians. You know, it, it actually it strikes me a lot like what uh, Saint Irenaeus is talking. When he talks about becoming a numismatic, right? Because he goes on in that same section to say that the person becomes holy. He becomes holy spirit, not not the Holy Spirit, but completely holy, completely. completely. Yes. Yeah, was just yeah, I thought, well, this looks very similar to the anthropology that Irenaeus seems to be espousing. You could well be onto something. I. When I, I taught for a year at St. Vladimir's Seminary 20 years ago, and I had a, a student from the Church of India, um, now, who, won, who wanted to do a master's thesis and did on St. Ephraim and Irenaeus. And he wanted to demonstrate that Ephraim knew Irenaeus, because there were so many echoes, as he saw it, of Irenaeus in St. Ephraim. And what he ended up with was, no, they're drawing from the same wells, but he's not citing Irenaeus. There's no evidence that Irenaeus was translated into Syriac you know, as early as the late 4th century. 
but they're drawing in the same wells. Which is a point in a way that I'm making with Afrahat and the, and the holy men, right? This is the great well of what scholars refer to as Second Temple Judaism. That is, that means the period from the return of the exiles from Babylon to the birth, well, to 70 AD, the era of the Second Temple. That is the, that is the matrix out of which Christianity itself emerges. And I tend to think Afrat certainly is, is one of the elements of my, uh, my demonstration. I tend to think that it emerges quite whole kind of crystallizes out of that solution in fundamentally the form that we have today, in the first generation. Think of St. Paul again. When he's arguing with people, is he arguing with them over who Jesus is? Almost never. I can't think of any instances, actually, in the Pauline epistles. And his, that's the earliest Christian those are the earliest Christian writings. He's, his fundamental argument over is, what are the boundaries of Israel in the Messiah, Jesus? He says they've been expanded to include the nations. But he's not arguing about over who Jesus is. That appears to have been commonly, commonly received. And it is obviously what our New Testament scholar friends call a high Christology. Yes. Jesus is divine. Okay, sorry. So this is the pool out of which they draw. Yes. So I had a philosophy professor in college say that uh, Christianity is uh, a little bit of Jesus and a lot of Greek philosophy, and you alluded to that today in the, the lecture. But uh, that's why St. Ephraim has been, a, in particular, has been a... A revelation. Yes, very much so. And uh, as well in the Akathist hymns, they say, you know, the philosophers became mute. Oh, yes, kids. and you read Ephraim, then you read the Akathistos, and it's pretty clear, you know. Uh, right. This is, again, the same wells. So, and find out that... Uh, Theosis is a Christian tradition, not a... Uh, Greek tradition and specifically. Yes, so your philosophy teacher was wrong. Right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I guess my, my question is how can that be applied for, I guess, modern studies? Uh, is, would it be like a, how would it look, how would it look today where, also St. Gregory the theologian said, from what I remember, I think I'm paraphrasing, where uh, to understand God, reason God with Aristotelian philosophy is no more. It's time to be schooled by the fishermen of Galilee. So how in, t in today's modern... That was the complaint of the Greek bishops of Florence. Oh, okay. Stop talking Aristotelicos, Aristotically, Aristotelically, and start talking Alieftikos, fishermen of Florence. So uh, I guess the question is how could that be applied today in modern seminaries or theology? Well, you, you can't imagine the temptation that your question is uh, posing me. Um, but I will rise above. <laughs> you know, when we were taught Old Testament, or at least the books we were given to read in seminary, I value them even to this day. I mean, they were good Germans, almost to a man. Deutsch, yeah. Very exact, they know everything, they know all the languages, yeah. So, Van Raad and Eichrod and Nobody Note and so on. And they got details really, really well. Invaluable for that. But the big picture, they're blinded to certain things. For example, that issue of theophany. And Father Bogdan has written extensively in this, and spoken extensively on this. <coughs> so, I will steal his thunder. 
I will steal Father Bogdan's thunder, who's written extensively on uh, theophanies. Say this, if you look at those German scholars of the Old Testament, they're nothing, or next to nothing. Well, covenant, yeah, it's a covenant, that's important, yeah. All this other, that's priest stuff. It's a covenant, yeah. Well, there's the good Lutheran speaking. He has his theological lens through which he reads, or she. Most of these, always, always, almost always a he. Um, and no one reads it our way. And so far we've been, and even, you know, the great, you know, the great revivers of the patristic tradition, the patristic scholarship in, 19, in the 20th century, uh, the, uh, <coughs> the Théologie Nouvelle of uh, Danielou and de Lubac, uh, von Balthasar's kind connected with this. You know, they're great. Or in the Russian immigration, Vladimir Lossky and George Florovsky, uh, lesser lights are Kiprian Karen, uh, Basil Krivoshin, and a graph down to the American, the ones who showed up in America, Schmem and Mayandor. Uh, they're great. Great. Florovsky is unmatched for lapidary brilliance and putting his finger on issues. But you look for the Old Testament in him, you know, he knows about as much as a well-informed seminarian from Odessa in 1906. And as he didn't leave his class, yes. He knows a lot about the New Testament scholarship, but nothing, else. that's just such a foreign thing. When it's not foreign, if you look at, at the liturgical tradition, at the ascetical, at the, at, the, at the ascetical writers, you read a Maximus and you find just oodles of references to tabernacle, temple, uh, to those incredibly dull chapters in Exodus after Moses goes up the second time. You know, that stuff about yarn and kinds of wood and cubits it goes on forever. It's boring, it's just unbelievably boring. Um, <clears throat> Gregory Nyssa spends half his life of Moses on those chapters. Uh, likewise, the ancient rabbis could not get enough of them. Because, why? Because it's the revelation of true worship. But that's theophanic. And from that revelation of true worship, I would maintain our liturgical, with it, our liturgical uh, tradition is in continu fundamental continuity. So the people that we were asked to read are not going to illumine us as to that. What is hopeful is that in recent times, and I'm talking, you know, last, what, 30 years, 40? Okay, let me give you a condensed spiel. Back in 1942, five, a Jewish guy named Gershom Sholem wrote a book called Major Trends in Jewish Mysticism. An invaluable book, especially the first two chapters. Now, Sholem was a rationalist, wonderful scholar, but rationalist. Still, he was interested in, in his own tradition, and especially in Kabbalah, the main form of Jewish mysticism from the 13th century on. And he wanted to know, where does it come from? And he noticed parallels with the Kabbalists in the Old Testament and pseudepigraphical apocalypses of the Second Temple. His problem was that the last of those is written about 200 AD, and Kabbalah is properly inaugurated in the 13th century, so that's a millennium. What's happening in between? And he finds medieval manuscripts of 
purporting to describe ascents through the seven heavens to the divine throne in the seventh heaven. And the vision of the enthroned, the one, the one enthroned on the chariot, on the chariot throne. And the manuscripts were all medieval. But all the manuscripts of the Makarian homilies are medieval too. And we know that she's fourth century. Um, so Sholem argued that these are a kind of in, in between. Yes, in between. They demonstrate the continuity in Jewish thought from apocalyptic era materials to the Kabbalah 13th century. Now why do I, why do I go into that? Well, because it has relevance to the study of other things. When they unearthed the Qumran scrolls and they found materials in them, as noted the songs of the seven of the Sabbath sacrifice, that sound like those hekalot, those those uh, those ascents to the to the chariot throne, and like the ancient apocalypses. A, a lot of scholars, both Christian and Jewish, said, hey, maybe Sholem's onto something here. And maybe this business of continuity can explain things in St. Paul, can explain things in beginning Christianity as well as the rabbinic materials. So it set off a new industry. However, this new industry has not yet, as it were, penetrated New Testament studies, or Old Testament studies. So you better get... Ask him. You've got him. You've got him teaching here, right? Right. Well, you ask him a lot, um, because this is his ballpark. Uh, so you ask him to play in it a little bit for you, right? Right. And that will be the end of the question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. to you brothers glorious enlighteners holy fathers of our church glory to you teachers of the truth of Christ glory to you who brought us the written word Glory to you who brought us the written word.